Jesus' name, amen. Morning, City Church. How are you guys? So I want to talk a little bit about the Louisiana building. Uh, a lot has been going on. Do you realize that it's been like five weeks since the transition? I mean, it seems like, to me, it seems like about three years. Um, to you, maybe it's like, oh, wasn't that last week? I don't remember. But, but it's been like five weeks since the transition, and uh, a lot has happened. Uh, so we've, we basically turned this building over to the city or sold this building to the city. We bought the other building. Uh, we had a work day, and uh, I'm going to actually put some pictures up in the lobby uh, starting next week so that you can see all the smiling faces, all smiling dirty faces, holding tools and, and looking like uh, American Gothic with the, them stand there with the rake and everything. And uh, so what we've been doing behind the scenes is bringing in all these contractors, and so we, uh, tomorrow there's an air conditioning company coming. We've had an electrician in two or three times uh, to add lighting to the various places. We brought in two different carpet companies, um, a landscape company, a window company, a gutters company, uh, plumbers. Um, that, those are the ones I can think of. <laughs> so trying to arrange those, and then when they don't show up, and then you got to call, so you wait a week for them to have the appointment with them, and then they don't show up, and then you have to call someone else and wait another week, and so we've had a few of those. Now we're at the point where we've, like, started sending out deposit checks and, and setting up time frames and stuff, and so now we're trying to get everything done. So I've had many people ask me, well, how can I help? I want to do something. We will get to that point. Right now, we are getting down to the bare bones of that building. So it's going to have new carpet, and hopefully next week I'll show you kind of the new carpet. I'll show you a color scheme for the kids' church, which is really cool. Uh, I will uh, might even show you a budget if for all you nerds out there. Um, ever, who, who doesn't like a budget? <laughs> uh, so our next work day is primarily going to be uh, painting. Um, and so... If you, if you can do this, wax on, wax off, you know, we just watched Karate Kid and, and like, uh, Mr. Miyagi got him to do, like, his whole house. Um, so if there's any youth that want to know about uh, how to do karate, I can show you. Um, I won't be able to, like, translate the wax on, wax off and, and the circle and this and, and that, but maybe you'll be able to do the crane at the end of it uh, for those of you that know about uh, about the Karate Kid. So have you enjoyed the going through the series of Joshua? It's been good. It's been a long time since I had gone through Joshua. Uh, basically, they had camped on the other side of the Jordan River. They'd been in the desert for 40 years, and you got this entire, the tribe of Israel, or the tribes of Israel, all on the other side of the Jordan River. Uh, God does a miracle, basically brings them across the Jordan River. Uh, they go into the... Uh, city of Jericho, they defeat Jericho, the walls fall down, God gives them, they go in, they, they destroy them, and then it gets to Joshua 7. Now who can tell me what Shakespeare play, uh, or what is the big line from the Shakespeare play Hamlet? Now there's probably several big lines, but there's one of them that, that really sticks out. Uh, basically they've just seen the ghost, the soldiers standing on the wall have just seen the ghost, and so, and one of them says... You bunch of losers. What was it? What was it? Say it again. No, it's not to be or not to be. It's when they see the ghost. There's something rotten in the state of Denmark. You uneducated heathens. <laughs> Study your Shakespeare. To be honest, I wouldn't have known it either if I had asked. 
yeah, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Now, in 1937, March 18th of 1937, something happened in New London, Texas. Basically, there was a loud explosion that, that raised the local school there literally off of its foundations. And it wasn't just a small school. 300 students and teachers were killed. This was in 1937. New London isn't exactly a big metropolis, but it, it was big enough that they had a school of several hundred people. The school board was using natural gas siphoned off of a local oil company. So when, basically when they are drilling for oil and stuff, one of the byproducts is natural gas. And so they were using that natural gas to save on heating. Well, what they didn't realize is there was a leak. And this leak was filling the basement full of natural gas. And it only took one spark, and it literally blew the entire elementary, or not elementary school, but the entire school up off of its foundations. From that point, the government added a regulation that you had to put an odor in natural gas. If, if you didn't put this odor in, so when you smell natural gas, you're actually not smelling natural gas. You're smelling this odor. It's called uh, methan, methanethiol. Yes, methanethiol. Um, and basically, this stink saves lives. Okay? So if, if you didn't have that smell, like, you, you wouldn't know that there's something wrong. There's something good about, like, something that smells bad. Because you know that there's something wrong in there. Okay, we, we came into our house one time and we're like, what does that smell? Something doesn't smell right. And we're literally walking around the house like, <laughs> like something didn't smell right. And, and we can never figure it out. And then it kind of went away. And like six months later, we're cleaning out our front closet. And we had this box full of gloves. And we're pulling out the gloves just because some of them were like little kid sizes and our girls had gotten older and stuff. And we get to the very bottom of the box and there's this dead mouse. Skeleton, yes, it was a skeleton. We were like, ah, that's what stunk. It was this mouse down in there. Now, we would have never even known that something was dead and dying except that you could smell it. Now, if we had like hunted and stuff long enough, we might have been able to find it. Uh, but, we, but we weren't able to. So then we get to Joshua chapter 7, and it says, so they just had an amazing victory. They are, so they've walked around Jericho seven times. The trumpet sounds, they give a loud shout, and it says the walls fall down. So Aiden was actually telling me that he had uh, read an article that they found ancient Jericho, and what had happened is the walls had actually collapsed into the ground around Jericho. And that the walls are still there below where basically the tell where the ancient city of Jericho is. So basically the walls just went boom into the ground. The Israelites went in. They had this amazing victory. They're celebrating. La, 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 la. They're probably dancing around the fire that night. And like they're happy and stuff. But something was rotten in the state of Israel. And it says in Joshua chapter 7. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. So what God had told them to do is when you go in there, I don't want you taking a cent. I don't want you taking anything. Nothing. Anything. You know what anything means in the Greek? It means anything. Don't take anything. And they went in there, and there's gold, and there's jewels, and there, there's a variety of things. And they killed basically every living soul and their animals that were in there. But Israel sinned. Now Joshua sent men, oh, excuse me, I skipped something, um, in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now you know what Achan's name means? It means trouble. Here comes trouble. I mean, who names their kid trouble? Like, I've actually seen people that have named their kid Bathsheba. I'm like, what are you thinking? It doesn't name their kid Jezebel. Like, now, maybe they don't know anything about the Bible, and they're like, oh, that's a cool name. It was one of the lists in the, the book of 9,000 names that you can choose. 
I actually read a story about someone that named their, they were at a hospital and they named their twins Sophilus and Genaria. I want, <laughs> nothing needs to be said. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. So Ai is basically north of Jerusalem and a little bit to the east, which is near Beth Avon to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy on the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. Joshua's like, we got this. Let's just send a little group up there, and the rest of us can sit back and drink our iced teas and watch them go off and, and rout the city, because God's with us. Obviously, Joshua didn't have that, that sense of smell. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. Now, I'm thinking 3,000, 36, roughly a little more than uh, 0.1%. That's not so bad, but that's think about those 36 families. They're upset. Only 36 of them. They chased the Israelites. Did I get my math right? 3%. Sorry. <laughs> like the Holy Spirit was like, no, your math's wrong. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, I love this phrasing. Now, this is poetic phrasing, and whoever wrote this was awesome. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Did you ever see the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're standing in front of the, the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant? The Nazis are, and they're like, yes, we're going to get God, and we're going to use him for our power and stuff, and then their faces melt off. I mean, that's kind of what it was. It, it was... The, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. It just like, I mean, that's so descriptive, and you know exactly how they feel. Have you ever been so scared that it was like you had no backbone, you had no heart, you were like, this is done. Most of us probably have. So things were going so well, and then failure came. Don't you wish you could realize, gosh, things are going really well, why is it that I feel like I need to knock on wood? Why do we do that? Why do we knock on wood? Why do we assume that that's going to help anything? Why, why, do, why does failure often come right after a big success? It's because we don't handle the things, we don't handle the success with humility and in following God's will. So the Israelites were unfaithful. Notice it didn't say, and Achan was unfaithful. It was the Israelites when one of us sins, it affects us all. Only a few people live there. Ah, we can take them. 3,000 attacked the city and 36 died. Now, there's a thing called the Lance Nose. And it started with my grandma and maybe even her parents or something like that. First time I ever brought Sarah to meet my grandmother, my dad's, da my dad's mom. Um, my uh, papa had already died, and, and uh, so I, I bring her in to meet my grandma. And I had already warned Sarah. I said, she is a country girl from a farm in Colorado, like out in the middle of nowhere. And she's just blunt. And that's why I had warned Sarah. And so she comes in, and I said, Grandma, this is my girlfriend, or maybe fiance. No, I was girlfriend at the time. This is my girlfriend, Sarah. And she goes up, and she hugs her, and she says, Woo, you stink. And Sarah, being the gracious person that she is, was like, oh, Grandma. Like, didn't even phase her. Now, I had warned her. But my grandma, I, I'm like, what do you mean she stinks? I think she smells nice. She's like, well, she's got some perfume or something on. You know what it was? It was called shampoo. <laughs> but she had, like, the Lances have this nose that you walk into a region and you can smell something. My dad has it. Ask my mom. My mom's like, yep, he has it. I walk into the house, and I'm like, something stinks. Like, it's the trash. Yes, well, let's get rid of it because it's killing me. Um, like certain shampoos or whatever. I got COVID, and my smeller just was all messed up. Like toothpaste smelled like an outhouse. It was the strangest thing. Um, yeah, I'd go into a coffee place, and it smelled like a dump. 
It didn't stop me from getting coffee because as soon as I drank it, it was almost like my nose was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Did you ever see the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? They had the child catcher, and he had the big long nose and stuff. I, that guy gave me nightmares. But he'd go around, and he'd sniff out kids and stuff. I think I could have applied for that job. So Joshua makes three statements after they're routed in AI. And isn't this just like us? Why did you bring us here, God? Like, you just had the greatest victory. You saw these huge walls fall into the ground. You went in and you routed the city that you would have never been able to go into. Why did you bring us here, God? Just to have us fail. And then he says, we could have stayed on the other side of the Jordan. As if that was any good. It was a desert over there. There was nothing over there. But Josh was like, all he could see was the bad. And like, why are we here? God, you've moved us into this place, and this isn't good. What have you done to us? Our first reaction was, ooh, I just spit. Front row, beware. Our first reaction when something goes wrong is, God, why are you doing this to me? Our first reaction should be, Jeff, why are you doing this to yourself? What did you do? Because God's not a big bully in the sky. It's something that you did. And he has a lot of mercy and grace, and he gets us out of a lot of situations that we probably don't even know. And then he says, you know what? Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say? I, don't need, I can't even say anything to you, God. Like Now, I don't know if this was like, on the one hand, he's like, you know, God, I don't have any words to say. I'm just going to be silent and listen to you. That's what you kind of hope, he says. But on the other hand, it's like, God, this is so such a mess, and you've blown this up. I don't even have any words to say. I'm not talking to you. He folds his arms, and he turns on God, and he's like, I'm not even talking to you. And then he twists it around, and he says, God, what are you going to do for your great name? How are you going to fix all of this? It's kind of crazy because we talk to God that way about our own life. God, why did you put me in this situation? I have to admit, I have said that. Here's God's reply. This is awesome. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. And in parentheses, in the Jephaniah translation, it says, you big weenie. Stand up, you big weenie. What are you doing down on your face? Quit feeling sorry for yourself. You know, we can't move forward because we're so, we're, we're feeling sorry for ourselves. You're in trouble. It's not God that put you in trouble. It's you that put you in trouble. We're struggling. It's not God that did it. It's you that did it. And the only way to get out of it is to go to God. He is our only way out. All the disciples, they got to the point where a bunch of the disciples had left. And Jesus turns to his closest disciples. He says, do you want to leave too? And Peter says something so profound. He says, where else would we go? You have the words of life. You know, we can go to some other places. We can go serve some other gods. We can go serve ourselves. We can live for the world. We can do all this stuff. But the real answer is just with Jesus. So then in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 11, it says, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. Notice that it says they have lied. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have made, been made liable to destruction. So when you have hidden sin, not only does it open you up for destruction and for the devil to come in and for the world to come in and stuff, to do stuff inside your life that, that brings destruction, it also makes you a coward. It says they turn their backs and run because they've been liable to destruction. When you open yourself up, you no longer trust the holy God because you know that you violated that trust. 
God didn't violate that trust. You violated that trust. You've had this hidden sin, and now it's opened the door to a bunch of stuff. And the only way to fix it is to go to God, confess that sin, and say, God, I'm going to follow you. And it is called sin, just to be black and white about this. It's not called a mistake. We, like, we got to go to God. We got to say, God, I blew it. I made a, <laughs> I almost said I made a mistake. Yes, I made a mistake. I was wrong. God, this, this is against you. And then God says, I won't be with you until you destroy everything. Okay, you have some hidden sin in your life. I don't know what it is, but if something just popped into your head, yes, that's your hidden sin. Power of suggestion. It says they ran to the tent and spread out all the things before the Lord. So if you have hidden sin, you're opening yourself up for destruction. And so you got to go in there and you got to get everything out and you got to lay it before the Lord. You know what laying it before the Lord means? It means confessing your sins to one another. It means telling someone else about it so that you can be held accountable. Listen to this. This is out of Luke chapter 1. Excuse me, Luke chapter 12. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now yeast is what you put in bread to basically make it rise. And so yeast is like throughout the bread. You can't, it's not just in one little place on the bread and stuff, but it's actually mixed in. And yeast is a bacteria that feeds on the sugar, and it creates a gas, which basically makes the bread rise. So this yeast is all within the bread, and Jesus says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. So he's like, you've got a loaf of bread, don't let those bacteria get in there. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. That should scare you to death. And if that doesn't, I have a story for you. I had a pastor that was a mentor for me. This was 30 years ago or 35 years ago. <clears throat> and I was in a men's group with this pastor, and I met with him on a weekly basis and had a very good friendship with him. And uh, he was really encouraging to me, and I was in a insecure part of my life and stuff and he and he really brought me out of that and he helped talk me through a lot of situations uh helped me make decisions about college and, and various things and we were in a men's bible study one time and we were talking about marriage and he he said ac from across the table from me i was on the kind of the foot of the table and he was at the head of the table and there were probably another 10 other men in this in this room and he says uh, to all the men, he says, I could never cheat on my wife. And I remember thinking, that is a really odd statement. What we didn't know is he was cheating on his wife at that point. He was our pastor. He was leading us. And he had this hidden sin that was going on. Here's how he got found out. He and the other person that was in the church, uh, the lady that he was with, they would write love letters to each other, but they wouldn't mail them because they didn't want to get caught. And, the, and texting wasn't a thing at that time and, and whatever other WhatsApp or anything like that. And so they would go up into the East Mountains and they would go on this trail that led into the forest and they would write these letters and read them to each other and then they would fold them up and they would put them in a box. They'd bury the box in the ground, cover it up, and then they'd come separately back into town in different cars through different ways. And you're thinking, you know, that's pretty smart. But the thing is, is that God knew. And what is hidden, God wants to reveal. There happened to be an elder from another church that was up deer hunting. And he had put a deer blind up in a tree and was sitting in the deer blind, and he saw this couple come up this trail and dig in the ground and pull it out. And, and like, he was trying to be quiet because he's trying to shoot some deer. 
not knowing that he was seeing something else that was going on. And then they, they put the box back in the ground, and he just left. He's like, I'm not even going to touch it. Just let them go. And, and they left, and he continued hunting. He comes back into town that evening, and he's invited to a pastor's meeting. And he goes to this pastor's meeting, and he sees my former pastor in this meeting with his wife. And he's like, that is not the same woman that I saw up in the mountains. And so he started asking some of the other pastors, who is this man? Long story short, he finds out that that other person, they don't know. And so he calls one of the elders and he says, I need you to come with me. They drive up in the mountains. He takes them to that very spot. They dig up the box, read the letters, and it all gets found out. They go and confront the pastor, and the pastor denies it. And then they take the box out from hiding and set it on the table. Can you imagine the look on that pastor's face? I'm telling you, that pastor is not unique. If you are hiding sin, God is going to reveal it. It may be now, it may be later. And it is better to deal with it. Go before God. Show some humility. Go before other people. Do you know why God wants to expose stuff? Think about this. What do we always say about cancer? They caught it in time. If you have hidden sin, it's like cancer inside of you. And the worst thing that you can do with cancer, boy, it got quiet in here. Pastor Jeff, you're being really hard on us. But it's like a cancer inside of you. And the sooner that it gets identified and comes out, the sooner it can be treated. But if it just sits there, you know what the cancer that gets a lot of people is prostate cancer. You know why? Because men don't want to go in and have a prostate exam. I mean, that's kind of embarrassing. It takes a whole day away from work or whatever else you want to do. It's uncomfortable. But you know what? Sometimes you just have to do that. We want to have things identified. So I want to ask you, what's your secret sin? Just raise your hand. We'll just say it right now. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) A couple of you just went, oh, Jesus, please no. See, God, God knows I've heard of them, of people having wounds that were so infected that what they did is like uh, in, in a war when it would get infected, they would just cut them open and they would leave the wound open to the air so that it wouldn't gain any more infection. They, they would just leave it open to the air. God wants to heal that infection in you. Here, there, there's three reasons why, and I'm going to you, give you three reasons why. The first one is hidden sin isn't confessed, and it can't be held accountable. Now, if you have hidden sin, you're not confessing it. So that means you're not getting past it. You're not getting over it. Your spiritual life is compromised. Someone with cancer is tired. They're worn out. um, They don't have the energy that they used to have. um, And it's affecting their entire life, whether they know it or not. So you're not confessing this stuff, and you're not getting it dealt with. You're not having any sort of accountability. And you know what you'll do is you will actually deny that it's even there. Oh, I don't have cancer. I've, had, I've heard of people that have actually gotten a cancer diagnosis, and they say, no, I don't have cancer. Well, yes, you do. You have cancer whether you believe it or not, just like there's a God whether you believe in him or not. Truth is truth. There's a scripture that says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful powerful and effective. You know what? The person that's sick may not be the righteous person that this verse is talking about. It's the person that you go to because you're not being very righteous if you've got this hidden sin. And so you're supposed to go to this other person. Another scripture in 1 John, it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So if you're denying sin, God's word is not going to be speaking inside of you. You're basically cutting it off. And that leads to the second thing is hidden sin brings deception. When you're hiding something, <laughs> I love this about kids. At least our kids were this way. We could always tell when they were being deceptive. It was like, thank you, Jesus, for that sixth sense that parents get when they, when it got quiet in their room, Sarah and I, we'd be watching TV and, and all of a sudden we'd pause it. It's too quiet. Sure enough, we go back there and there's Abby coloring on the wall. There, there's joy. <laughs> Sarah's like, and on the bed and on the, there's, there's joy getting into something she's not supposed to. You know what? Mom and dad didn't know, but God knew. And he's like, I'm going to make them quiet. And man, it was like our ears would, it was like the spidey sense would get going. We go back there and I love doing this. What are you doing right now? <laughs> I ask your forgiveness now, but oh man, it was so much fun. <laughs> Here's another way that it's deceptive is that you will put on a face that isn't real. Oh, I'm holy. I show up to church and I worship God, but I'm cheating on my wife. You just put on a big fake persona. You said, I'm following God when you're really not. When what you should be doing is, man, I am struggling. I'm having a hard time. I need to confess this. I need to get healed. You know what? That marriage will never get healed until that gets exposed. Now, enough damage might have been done, like if cancer gets in your body enough, if an infection gets in your body enough, it might have done enough damage because it didn't get dealt with soon enough that it kills you or that it, it takes an arm off or something. And that can happen with hidden sin, is if it lasts long enough, it might be too late. I wish that we had like super sense didn't even come out right, like super noses, uh, superhero noses, and we kind of do, it's called discernment in the spirit, but I wish you could walk into the church and be like, ooh, they stink, what's going on with you, like be able to just point them out and just deal with it right there, like it, it, I wish it could happen that easily, like as a, as a leader, it'd be so much easier, like just go in, kind of, no, you stink, um, you, you go to the back of the church, talk with the prayer team, confess what you need to pray. But it, it doesn't work that way. But sometimes it does. Sometimes God gives you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. Sometimes he sends you deer hunting to let you see something that you don't expect to see. Here's the third thing, is that hidden sin brings confusion. Listen to this scripture. This is in Galatians. And this is Paul talking to the church of Galatia. The church of Galatia was following Jesus and they, were, they had great faith and they were following him in faith. And Pharisees, or not necessarily Pharisees, but those that were following the law, basically talked them into following the law again. And Paul says, you are running a good race. Who cut in uh, on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. In other words, that thing is not from God. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Here's that whole yeast thing. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. So if you're ever in a situation and you're like, man, I'm just confused. I don't, something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't se seem right. It might just be hidden sin. It might be something going on. You know what I pray? God, expose it. God, if there's something there, expose it. Go in and reveal it so that it can be dealt with. Because that confusion causes problems. It will, it will bring down an entire church because of confusion. And, and people are like, all of a sudden you start seeing people leave the church for a variety of reasons. All of a sudden you start seeing people walk away from God. It's because that stink got in there and the devil's working and stuff. And God's trying to reveal it, but we can cover it up. 
And that's what happened with Achan. Have you ever wish, or, or, you, or you know that feeling that after hidden sin is revealed, you're like, how did I not see that? It was so obvious. People are always asking that after suicide. How did I not see that coming? Because it was hidden. I've had several friends commit suicide. It's hard. How did I not see that? Some of them I saw coming, and you try and help them, and, and you just can't. But how did I not see that coming? I imagine that's what Joshua asked. And so this is God's response to Joshua. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Do you realize sin is going to happen? It's just going to happen. You can expect that there's going to be hidden sin around you. You can expect that people are going to sin around you and they're going to do something stupid. And we have to fight through that. We have to say, God, I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm going to keep following you because there's victory even in the midst of this. And that's what happened is they went back against AI. They set a trap for them. They put people behind the city. And then they, they sent a little small army out in front. And they went up to the gates and they started to fight them. Then they turned and ran. And all the men of AI were like, hey, we're going to rout them again. It says not a person was left in the city. And they all went out and they attacked AI. Or excuse me, they, uh, they went to attack the Israelites. When that happened, the, the ambush came around to the front, went into the city, didn't, wasn't, weren't even opposed, and basically were burning everything. And then the men of Ai, they're chasing the Israelites, and they turn around, and they see the city behind them and burning, and then they knew what happened. And then all those men, all those Israelites came out of the city, and all the men of Ai were trapped between the two armies, and, it, and they killed them all. tribe of Israel, and we're going a little long today, but this is kind of my last thought. The tribe of Israel, they go to a place called Shechem, and it's now in a, it's now called Nablus. It's in, it's considered the West Bank of Israel. So like Israel kind of, the West Bank kind of looks like two beans um, or a, maybe one big bean or something, but the, the big part on the top, Nablus or Shechem is like right in the middle of that. Nablus is basically uh, what the Arabs call it. And it sits between two hills. And it sits between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. So you can go to the town and it sits in a valley. And it was like a natural amphitheater. And in Deuteronomy it says, the uh, See, I am setting before you a, today a blessing and a curse. This was basically God saying to Moses and all the Israelites, this was a ways back. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I have commanded you today to follow other gods, which you have not known. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings and on Mount Ebal the curses. Now I looked for a picture of this and I couldn't really find a good picture. But if you go to that town and you look at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, it's really interesting because Mount Gerizim is like there's a lot of forest on it. And Mount Ebal has like this little tiny forest on it and it's bald. And so even after all these years, all the blessings that were proclaimed on Mount Gerizim and all the curses that were pro pronounced on Mount Ebal, those came those are still in action. That mountain is cursed and that other mountain is blessed. And you got this town in between and it's like people in the town, they can look and they can see the results of one or the other. Now listen to this verse out of Hebrews. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful for those whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. We have a, a wrong view of the blessings of God. God blesses everybody. We're all land. And I'm not just talking about this church, but I'm talking about the world. God has blessed the world. He's given them nature. He's given them food. He's given them all, all this stuff. God has blessed the world. And, and not just 
given us blessings, but often, this verse says often, that the rain comes down. But what happens is that if you produce a good crop from the blessings that God gave you, then you'll be fruitful and you'll produce something good. But if you produce a bad crop, in other words, if you don't produce anything except thorns and thistles, then God's going to look at that land and he's going to be like, you know, we have to deal with that land because it's going to spread. Now, everybody in New Mexico knows about goat head plants, right? About three years ago, I drove onto our street. Now, we didn't have a goat head plant on our yard anywhere, nowhere. And we tur I turn onto my street, and at the very end of the street, I'm driving by and I'm looking at the ground, and I see these goat head plants. And like by the end of the summer, they had already made it to the next intersection. And then we have like one more block, and then it's, it's our house. And I was like, oh, you guys need to kill your goat head plants. They're heading my way. I mean, those things are awful. They get in, get in your, uh, your clothes. You end up dragging them into your house, and you're walking barefoot, and, and it's like someone just reached up and stabbed you in the ankle. I mean, you're just you're hopping around, and, you, and it's this little tiny thing. But one of those device, one of those little goat heads will produce a plant that has like 200 or 300 other goat heads on it. And those things, they get on rabbit's fur and cat's fur and, and the wind blows them down and stuff. Within the next year, our yard was covered with them. And I am out there. You can't just spray them because then the seeds will create more plants. You have to go out there and you have to root them out and root them out and root them out. Here's the thing is if God, I've talked with people in nursery. You know what they say to do with goat head plants? Nuke it. Destroy it. Get out the roundup and kill it. And when they start to come up, kill it again. And when it comes up again, kill it again and just keep nuking it. Because you can't get rid of those. I actually did a little research and I found out that there's a little, uh, a little uh, mite or something like that that you can actually buy and they will go and they will eat those it's called puncture vine. They'll eat those seeds. But in order to get enough for my yard, it was going to be like $3,000 or something like that. But you have to go in there and you have to weed that out. Hidden sin grows up into thorns and thistles. And sin that's not deal with. And all of a sudden, the entire neighborhood is full with it. And so you've got to nuke it. And if you don't, God's going to come along and say, okay, you're not dealing with it. I'm going to expose it, and I'm going to nuke it. And we don't want that. Let's go ahead and stand. Here's the way curses work. God gives us a blessing. And in that blessing, we have a response to make. Hey, Aaron, my mic went off. We have a response to make. <clears throat> we can produce fruit or we can produce thorns and thistles. The curse comes that you have to destroy those thorns and thistles. That's what a curse from God is. The Bible talks about, it says that Moses went to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. Charlton Heston, let my people go. And, and in the Bible it says, that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then the next verse, every time Moses came back, it says Pharaoh uh, hardened his heart before God. Pharaoh hardened his heart before God. And then there's a switch in scripture and it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It had gotten so bad that God was like, you know, the only way to deal with it is to just destroy it. And it swallowed him up. So we can take the blessing of God and we can turn it into weeds. Here's what God wants. This is what he prophesied to Abraham about uh, the Israelites. 